UCI's continued support. As Vice Chancellor of Health Affairs at the University of California, Irvine, Dr. Goldstein oversees a $2.4 billion enterprise comprised of the Susan and Henry Samueli College of Health Sciences, UCI Health, and the UCI Centers and Institutes of Health. He is, a leading, he is leading a major expansion to unite health disciplines. UCI's unique model is driven by the UCI Health Affairs mission, discover, teach, heal. Notably, UCI Health serves nearly 4 million people as the Orange County region's only academic health system. Right now, a new complex, UCI Health Irvine, will increase access to care now provided by the 460-bed hospital in Orange and 14 other service sites across the region. With over 30 years of experience as a physician scientist, pediatric cardiologist, and academic administrator, Dr. Goldstein focuses on improving the human condition through education, research, and care. He has served as a scientific advisor to the National Institutes of Health for Nanomedicine and vice chair of the National Science Foundation Advisory Committee for Biological Sciences. Please welcome Dr. Stephen Goldstein. for that introduction. Um, it, it is a pleasure to be here, uh, inspiring for this third annual um, uh, Nixon uh, National Cancer Conference. Incredible progress every year, incredible opportunity. I'm, I'm gonna take a moment to insert a comment about the great sessions that we had this morning. Um, and, and what I'd like to offer is an answer to Dr. Siegel's question and maybe bring up a risk and an opportunity that the extraordinary panel didn't touch on, but it was really incredible. Um, the answer to the question of who's gonna lead gets to what Cliff said. Monica Bertinoli, the head of the NIH, is so on top of this. It's not just M-code. She is looking at all of us and, and saying, Without adequate data, we can't do AI. The data is everywhere and distributed. She is working on putting bills through the Senate and other funding mechanisms so we can actually pull this off. And I actually, from last night, because we're, we're working on this with her, just one comment of where they are. The NIH director under HHA's auspices is creating and deploying a de facto multi-tenant model whereby individual sites and entities make their highest fidelity data available between partners without normalization through subtraction while preserving lineage, provenance, and provisions back to each data element generated to or prescribed by the individual patient. And it goes on from there. This is the type of data that will let us do the things we want to do. And it will be bringing the data together from all of us and uh, protecting where it comes from, but allow us to do the things we, the incredible things we talked about this morning. So the risk I want to add to the, to the discussion because it didn't explicitly come out, is this is the patient's data. And all of this has to be under patient control. And the opportunity I want to mention is, we touched on briefly, is about real world evidence. All of those things that we do to make sure someone fits into a clinical trial is different than what happens when the medications go out into the wild. All of a sudden, all the blinders are off and everyone is getting it. That is an incredible rich data source that will change how we think, how we deal with the patients, and it will speed the process to new discovery because if the FDA knows that it's gonna be studied on the back end, then it makes it easier to go forward on the front end. So I just, I thought the, the sessions were extraordinary this morning and I wanted to, add that in. So at UCI Health, we have the incredible advantage that we're ensconced in the loving arms of an entire university. And what that means is when I'm talking to you about AI, it's not just our health enterprise. We have a school of information and computer science we're working with and engineering. And it really is, is the added advantage we have as we come forward. 
Um, and UCI has been doing pretty well. This last year, it's one of the 71 AAU uh, institutions in the United States, but for the ninth year, it's a top 10 public university. And this last year, we had the fourth most applications in the nation for undergraduate education. Um, and over the last five years, doubled the research uh, portfolio to about six hundred million dollars. So that's doing fine. And UCI Health, as a part of that, is also doing incredibly well over the last four years. Um, I need to brag about Chef Left, Chad Left Terrace, our CEO, and what the hospital has been able to pull off. The Vizient organization, many of you will know, um, evaluates different uh, uh, academic medical centers. And this year, UCI Health was in the top 10 for both inpatient and outpatient among the academic medical centers, something I think is, is a real sign of pride and, and confidence. Um, and the trajectory that you just heard about is really, I think our strength is based on we bring all of our schools of health together with all of our institutes uh, and studies and our health system, and it operates as one virtuous cycle. We care for the patients, we learn what we're not doing well enough, we study it, we come back to what we teach, and that continuous improvement cycle means that we can give the best care to the patient today and make it better tomorrow. Um, obviously, I could talk about this for about three hours, so I won't. Um, when it comes to cancer, I am proud to say, as Orange County's um, uh, only academic medical center, and as the Orange County-based NCI Comprehensive Cancer Center for going on 30 years, we provide the most care to cancer patients in Orange County. And moreover, because five of the 56 comprehensive cancer centers are within the University of California, our cancer consortium altogether offers annually a thousand clinical trials. This is a way to really advance uh, the quality of care. We're supporting our cancer programs in many ways. One, we just are now building a new 215,000 square foot research building called the Falling Leaves Foundation Medical Innovation Building that will expand where our cancer research will expand. And any of you who have driven down Jamboree will have seen we're building a one million square foot new medical center. Thank you. And starting on June 12th, um, the um, uh, Chow Family Comprehensive Cancer Center and Ambulatory Care Building will begin seeing patients. That's 193,000 square feet. On April 30th, the uh, Josie Wenin Family Ambul uh, Advanced Care Ambulatory Building will begin seeing patient, uh, outpatients for pediatrics and adult care. And then a year later, the hospital itself will open up. And then there's more. <laughs> really close to home here in your Belinda, we've just opened up um, a cancer infusion center. Uh, with 16 sites, so that care is distributed um, around Orange County and we can reach our patients. So between discovery, teaching, and healing, we are proud to be a supporter of this enterprise and uh, delighted to be a part of everything uh, that you're doing here to advance cancer care. So thank you. It's now my pleasure to welcome Dr. Ellen Siegel, founder and chairperson of Friends of Cancer Research, a think tank and advocacy organization based in Washington, D.C., and probably, I am safe to say, the leading cancer and healthcare policy advocacy organization in the country. When she founded Friends in 1996, Dr. Siegel saw a compelling need to increase public awareness and support for cancer research and recognize the need for increased scientific capacity across all federal agencies. At that time, Dr. Siegel was a presidential appointee to the National Cancer Advisory Board, along with Marlene Malik, who joined Ellen in 1996 as president of Friends. Dr. Siegel holds leadership positions with a broad range of cancer advocacy, public policy organizations, and academic health centers, including MD Anderson Cancer Center External Advisory Board, 
and the inaugural Board of Advisors for the George Washington University's Milken Institute of Public Health. She currently serves on the board of the Foundation for the National Institutes of Health, where she chairs its governance committee. Dr. Siegel most recently served for 10 years as chair of the inaugural board of directors of the Reagan Udall Foundation. She is a member of the steering committee of the Nixon National Cancer Conference, and it's my pleasure to welcome her to introduce our lunchtime speakers, who she knows very well. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. What you should know is basically a Marlene Malik's friend. And all I need to do is just say I'm here with Marlene and everything goes very, very, very well. <laughs> she's, been a, she's been a proud partner and part of Friends from the very beginning. And um, her involvement is heartfelt and I'm proud to be a friend of Marlene's. But my task today is to um, introduce two remarkable women who need no introduction. That seems to be what they give me all the time to do, introduce people who need no introduction. But in any event, I'm going to try to give you some uh, highlights of people that you know and are well known in the field. Joan London needs no introduction. Everybody knows her, everybody admires her, and everybody loves her. But there, are, but there are some things, just a few things, I want to, uh, to use this opportunity to say about her. Joan London has used her many and great talents and the opportunities for her to make some very meaningful contributions. This is especially in, in, in the areas of cancer, awareness, medical health, education, aging, and caregiving, all incredibly important. Joan London was born in Northern California and began her broadcasting uh, in, Sacram in Sacramento for almost two decades, from 1980 to 19, from 1980 to uh, 1987. She was a part of the shared national experience as the co-host of Good Morning America. So we woke up to her every morning. They told me to say she was inquisitive, and I changed it to say she is inquisitive. Empathetic, empathetic, and as, as reported from 26 countries, covered four presidents and their first ladies, and the White House reported from five Olympic Games and talked us through two royal weddings. Well, I'd like to know a little bit more about that. Um, okay, and I'm still not finished. In, in 2007, she unexpectedly became the sole caregiver for her 88-year-old mother who was failing health after a number of mini strokes. As a result of her baptism by fire in the world of senior care, she became an expert, an advocate, and a spokesperson. In 2014, Joan Lund London was sideswiped with a devastating diagnosis of stage two triple negative breast cancer. That is not easy. Typically, but not easily, she decided to fight her cancer and cancer itself by going public. She returned to Good Morning America and talked about her diagnosis as her feelings, her fears, and her hopes. Her honesty and forthrightness in facing and describing the condition and the courage she showed in going public were a model and an inspiration. Happily, her treatment consisted of chemotherapy, surgery, and radiation, and was successful. And the next year, she told the whole story in an honest and vivid bestseller, Had I Known, a Memoir of Survival. So this is really important. And I'm, um, London, uh, she, uh, she now has a, a, a podcast called Second Opinion with Joan London, and the show is now in its 18th season, works to educate, promote good health, improve doctor-patient communication, and to empower people to take char charge of their own health care. So that's Joan London. So this is, um, I ask you to welcome her, but before you welcome her, I am going to introduce Julie Gerberding. And by the way, the remarks they gave me, I've shortened this by 60%. So we could have been here for two hours, but in any event, another remarkable and special woman is um, Julie G Gerberding. Uh, I'm honored and proud to int introduce Dr. Julie Gerberding and that you will hear from her shortly. And, and 
so, am proud to serve on the board of the FNIH with her. Julie is the Chief Executive Officer of the Foundation for the National Institutes of Health, the former director of the Centers for Disease Control and the most cited expert on public health and biosecurity, is virtually here with us in uh, Yerba Linda. Growing up in Brookings, South Dakota, at the age of four, Julie Gerberding decided that she wanted to be Julie Gerber, uh, Dr. Julie Gerberding. Having made up her mind, well, she certainly did achieve that at age four. That's pretty important. I have a six-year-old granddaughter that I'm saying she has to be a doctor, too, so I'm going to tell her about you, Julie. Um, she never wavered from that goal, and that was a good indication of the direction and determination she would lead her to great things. In the early and mid-1980s, she was an intern at the chief medical resident at UCSF specialized in infectious disease. In 1998, Julie went to CDC, I think I may have I skipped a page. Okay, disease at, okay, I did skip a, an important page, okay. And those were the years in San Francisco when the epicenter when HIV and AIDS appeared. So you can imagine her background and the critical public health need. Looking back on that terrible time when she had so, she had so many of her patients that died, she said, we learned to be humble doctors and to include patients in their own medical decision making. And when she says it, she really does mean it. That humility, that empathy, that dedication, and that sense of patient Centricity has continued throughout her career. In 1998, Julie uh, went to CDC, and, and in 2002, she became the director, first woman to hold that job. In 2004, she was on Time Magazine's list of the most 100 most influential people in the world. From 2005 through 2008, she was on Forbes Magazine's list of 100 most powerful women in the world. They should have also said, one of the nicest women in the world, too. Uh, Time concluded that such openness to collaboration is a hallmark of Gerberding, a style that will remain the key to show how the CDC handles future crises in two, 2004 and was the prophecy in 2024. That's a fact. She then went on to Merck, and I'm not even going to go through that, but now as CEO of the Foundation for the National Institutes of Health, Dr. Gerberding continues to support and encourage research in America and around the world. I'm proud to be on the board of FNIH and have worked with her during these critical times. This, um, the sense of purpose, uh, she has a sense of purpose. This sense of purpose has driven her life, that humility, that wisdom and that dedication to bringing meaning and value to others characterizes Julie Gerberding's career and defines her character. So now it's time to hear from Joan London and Ger uh, Julie Gerberding. Thank you. And I have some good stories I could tell you about from that royal wedding. <laughs> what a great room full of some of the best minds in cancer research. Uh, Julie was going to come and be here with us today, but she couldn't because she, uh, Julie, I think you're either Washington or Bethesda for an honor of Anthony Fauci today. Uh, I think I'm right, right? That's right, yes. We were unveiling his portrait. Aha, okay. Um, so I really want to talk to, to you, Julie, about the FNIH. But first, I want to go back to the CDC for just a moment because we are living, all of us, in this unsettling world where there is growing distrust of the healthcare system, of physicians, and even of science itself. And I think back to when I was covering the CDC for ABC and you were the director at the time, the first woman director ever. And uh, my takeaway was that I didn't really think that the American public truly understood 
the CDC's important role in our society, not only in you know, preparedness for medical bioemergencies and epidemics, but even down to the everyday health that is so crucial in everyone's life. Can you just take a moment to remind us in this time of public distress, uh, the CDC's role? Thank you, Joan. And I'm sitting here thinking we should be referring to as Dr. Joan. <laughs> um, you know, I like to think of the CDC as the organization that is on the front line of health protection, whether we're talking about pandemics or whether we're talking about just ordinary health and well being across the life stage. So, for example, it's CDC and your, your public health system that makes sure that new babies are screened for genetic diseases or have hearing tests. It's CDC that supports the outbreak investigations when we have a foodborne illness and we've got problems with our lettuce or our raspberries or whatever the problem may be. But CDC is also the source of much of the statistical health information that helps us understand what are the big issues, what is the status of Americans' health, what is happening with maternal mortality, and what do we need to do about it. So basically, assessing the health of America is a core function of CDC and the public health system. Um, beyond that, uh, there are centers for chronic diseases like diabetes and heart conditions, the injury center, which is really important in understanding traumatic brain injuries, uh, head trauma, et cetera, and the Birth Defects and Developmental Disability Center. One of the biggest surprises for me when I was at CDC was the Environmental Health Center, which has some of the best science in government, just unbelievable uh, science to really help understand what are the chemicals and the environmental uh, problems that contribute to uh, health complications of pregnancy all the way through complications at the end of life. So it's a very broad health protection agency, and you usually don't notice it unless something goes wrong. Yeah. Well, you went from that public health arena into the private sector at Merck, and then you've now gone on back once again. And I should say, after interviewing Julie a number of times, I mean, she started out in San Francisco, and she was doing her residency in the hospital there when the patients were first coming in and dying and they couldn't do anything for them and they didn't know what it was, it turned out to be the beginning of the AIDS epidemic. And you said that that kind of led you on this path to not necessarily just go into private practice but to go into public health. So here you are now again at the helm of the FNIH. I want to know what drew you to this role and the importance of the FNIH. You know, people sometimes wonder why would there need to be a foundation to support the NIH? It's a well-funded research agency, et cetera. But even with the support that the NIH has received, the possibility of what science can do is enormous, but no one can do it alone. And there are some really big problems, uh, like some cancers that we're talking about today, uh, like neurodegenerative diseases, like mental health disorders, where no one NIH institute or no academic research center or no biotechnology or pharmaceutical company can really solve. It takes an ecosystem. It takes private-public partnerships. But it's actually difficult for our government to establish partners in the private sector. And the FNIH functions primarily to build the collaborative team science that allows the NIH and the very best researchers there to interact with their counterparts across the biopharmaceutical space and the academic space, but also more recently foundations and patient organizations. So when you bring a wise crowd together in a pre-competitive way to try to understand either the basic biology or the opportunities to accelerate drug uh, development and approval, you really end up with catalysts that make drugs available faster for people who need them the most. Well, there's always seemed to be this incredible competitiveness um, you, you, amongst different, uh, the big research institutions uh, for the dollars, for the NIH dollars, the funding dollars, 
and also, might I say, maybe the accolades for the discovery. And <laughs> it was difficult, but we have been seeing a lot of progress in going from that silo form of research into what you call the team science, the team science in its finest form, to use your own words. Um, but talk to us about, has that aligning, has that new way of uh, team science, is it, is it progressing as quickly as we need in order to get the results that we need so badly? I think in the pre-competitive space, there's been tremendous progress. One catalyst really is the incredible expense involved in taking advantage of the tools of science that are now available to us. Some of the instrumentation and technologies are just cost prohibitive for everybody to have their own private stash, so to speak. So sharing resources is one big motivation. But also, as we begin to mature as researchers, we understand that having data is not the source of power. Sharing and learning from data and creating a data commons is a much more valuable resource. And to the extent that we can build integrated or federated data sets and take advantage of the universe of people working on a common problem area, we really can make progress. Kind of a prototype of that is a private-public partnership that FNIH was involved in many years ago getting started, something called ADNI, which was a private-public partnership focused on Alzheimer's disease. And they started in an era where there was very little known about biomarkers or diagnostics for Alzheimer's. But through the collaborations that have gone on through the years, uh, enormous progress has made, and I think is one of the reasons why we can now begin to have strong hope that there will be better treatments for neurodegenerative diseases. Sometimes the runway is still long, but the collaborative effort really does build that wise crowd and makes the data more valuable because more people can formulate hypotheses and use it to answer questions. And you've also um, impressed just the, the need to have patient involvement so that they can provide what you call that important lived experience. So how important is having that perspective, that evidence-based lived experience in obtaining the best results? You know, I have two personal frames on that. One you mentioned, and that is the experience of being trained in the era of HIV when we had no medicines, all of our patients died. And we had to understand medicine as an art and a very empathetic humanitarian endeavor. And so understanding our patients, not just as they laid in the hospital, but what was going on in their outside lives, a very patient perspective. They were our best teachers. So that really instilled that sense in me from the very beginning of my medical evolution. But fast forward to where we are today, when our patients have insights and perspectives on what they need, what they care about, and increasingly are coming to the table, not as people to tell us a story and help arouse our emotions, but as experts who bring their perspectives about their lived experiences to the very beginning of when we're even formulating the priorities for research. At FNIH, we put a new effort on uh, patient inclusion and patient centricity across our end-to-end -end platform. And I'm telling you, we learn so much and make adjustments in our protocols, who we're enrolling and why, what the studies might look like, really makes an impo important and powerful difference in how we prosecute the portfolio. Well, and what you're saying, it's also talking about the mental health of the patient. I know that mental health has been a big focus of FNIH. And it's also a big part of the struggle, I think, that patients face when they're facing a, you know, a dire diagnosis and battling cancer. So are, how are we dealing now with the kind of that holistic look and acknowledging something that's not always talked so much about throughout a cancer patient's journey? I think broadly speaking, you know, across the United States and in many other parts of the world, mental health really is the number one health challenge that people face. It's a part of many, many other conditions. And the stigma is still a barrier to really addressing it effectively. But, you know, science is also a barrier. 
we really haven't developed a lot of new targets for treatment of mental health diseases. We still diagnose most mental health conditions by using very subjective criteria. There's no blood test for depression, for example. Um, so we have so much basic biology to work out in these areas. And yet, uh, you're bringing up cancer, which is one very major um, area where mental health is, is is part of the whole disease discovery, treatment, and survival process. But it doesn't always get addressed in the context of the more traditional medical model. So, yeah, you know, I, I think it's um, an opportunity to not just improve survivorship, but to improve thrivership, <laughs> if you will, uh, to really help people be able to emerge from. Uh, their initial confrontation with cancer with something that looks like hope and a very positive spirit. And yet it gets neglected all too often. I remember my oncologist um, who was treating me said 10% of my job is making sure I've picked the right treatment. 90% of it is getting my patient through the battle and keeping yeah. that positive, strong attitude. You know, another focus I know uh, of the FNIH is maternal health and newborn health. And I want to talk about this in the terms of, it brings up two issues, which is access to good health care and also respect of the patient. So let's start with access to health care because that is a huge issue, obviously, in those fields of maternal health and newborn wellness. But it's also a huge aspect of getting the right care to the huge entire population. And people that aren't in metropolitan areas just don't have that, always have that kind of access to good care. No, it, it, it's one of those NIH, conditions. Julie, does the FNIH attack issues like that as opposed to just looking for new treatments? I, I think um, we have a population health portfolio that's quite ex extensive, and maternal health has been one of our priority areas. On a global basis, just this past year, uh, working with the National Institute for Child Health Development, um, a very large study, 33,000 people study was done globally that demonstrated that a single dose of a generic drug, azithromycin, during labor and delivery can reduce maternal infection by 35%. Um, maternal sepsis by 35%. For those who don't know, sepsis is very serious and often fatal condition. So yes, we're very involved in, in looking for solutions that have broad population health impact, and maternal health is one of those. Now we've moved on to begin to tackle preeclampsia and eclampsia, the hypertensive disorder that is one of the three leading causes of maternal mortality, even in the United States. So we, we try to tackle the important unmet needs, but we also do it with health equity in mind when we're making those priorities. So the second half of that is this respect of the patient, uh, and especially in communities of color, which I think has contributed to distrust in the healthcare system and, and even these days in science itself, but a distrust in those communities towards their doctors. How do we go about restoring the public health, which is really important right now? I think... It's, it's, a, it's a conundrum. I mean, I, I can't think of a better word. Um, trust is so easily broken and so hard to re-earn once you've lost it. And yet um, it, there are things that we're learning about the genesis of trust and mistrust and the intersection with misinformation and disinformation, which certainly is a driver of increasing the amount of distrust that we're experiencing. Uh, one of the uh, dimensions of that is to recognize that trust is usually not easily developed from the top down, like from the most senior people in government. Uh, it really is local. Uh, trust comes first from the people you already trust, people in your neighborhood, people in your church, people in your community or in your family. And so helping to make sure that those touch points, those influencers and in people's own personal ecosystem have good information and have reliable 
uh, resources to fall back on when they need to understand or know something. And that really has to be built from the ground up. I think we saw that during COVID when the vaccine programs that relied on local influencers and trustworthy people who already lived and interacted in the community, those communities had much better confidence in vaccination and much better uptake rate, rates. But it's very hard to uh, to influence that on a population level. And it's part of, in my opinion, that's why we need a public health system that works so that we have those local people on the ground who are interacting with the community and the community service organizations regularly, and they build trust over time in all of the ways that they interact and provide support to the community. It's interesting, the last time we spoke, we were talking about kind of where we went wrong with COVID, and you said that part of it was that it was all data, 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 you know, how many people were hospitalized and that we kind of forgot the human element. And that could have been part of the kind of coming apart. You know, it, it, it risk communication, as you know, you are an expert in it. Um, it, it. It starts with recognizing where people are. And while we didn't walk around as individuals and express our fear or our, our fatigue or all of the emotions that the pandemic created, we all had those feelings. And if you don't really acknowledge that it's scary, it's uncertain, it's stressful, it causes great disruption and sometimes other more serious emotional responses. So if you barge into that kind of a context and you're talking from your right, your left brain about data and statistics and what you should do and shouldn't do, you lose your audience out of the starting gate. I have to really begin with an expression of humanity. I'm so sorry we're in this situation. It's hard for everyone. And I sure wish we had better answers today. Here is what we do know. And based on what we know today, this is what we're recommending. But stick with us because we're learning as we go. And we'll be back with you tomorrow if we learn something that causes a change in the recommendations. Just something to express appreciation that this is really hard rather than coming in as an expert telling people um, the information in an abstract sense. We just missed the boat on that. Not everyone, by the way. Uh, my exemplar and favorite person to listen to during the pandemic was the woman who led New Zealand, because as the, uh, the, you know, the leader of that country, she did a brilliant job of risk communication. So go back and watch her videos if you want to see what good looks like. It's interesting because when I went back and looked at the video from when I first interviewed you the very first time, and I asked you the question, what is the most pressing danger to the public health? And I expected you to say epidemic or bioterrorism, and you didn't. You said obesity. So <laughs> is there enough research going on on this health issue since we all know that obesity leads to diabetes and cardiac problems and, and cancer. I think we really are reframing how we think a lot about a lot of chronic and metabolic diseases. One dimension of that is going upstream and recognizing that the driver of these conditions may lie way before we get to the actual symptoms of specific uh, outcomes that you're mentioning. And so the biology that's really driving inflammation or uh, the epigenetic changes that increase the risk for cancers and other conditions, we're really beginning to tease apart the biology there. And I think there's a convergence of the biology upstream from the outcomes that kind of splay out in many directions, often co uh, it, it, people have more than one condition because of this upstream effect. Um, with obesity per se, uh, I think you know it's great that we have a new class of medicines that will help people with um, medically relevant obesity. And I think the challenge here is that we've got to, on the one hand, make it clear that um, obesity is a medical condition and it needs to be treated as a health threat 
and the medicines that are available to properly treat it need to be reimbursed in the same way that other valuable medicines are reimbursed. On the other hand, we can't let this pendulum go to the point where everyone who feels like they're five or 10 pounds overweight and they don't fit into their skinny jeans anymore, uh, that they jump on one of these medicines. That, that would really be tragic. And yet I know there are many people who are reaching for uh, the new medicines with that in mind. We have no idea what the downstream effects will that, of that will be, but I fear that we'll be seeing, in many cases, harmful effects that are the unintended consequences of inappropriate use. So much to learn there, but I, I kind of hope these are the 1.0 version of the medicines and we'll have even better and safer medicines coming forward in the future. Well, the last time we spoke about this, and you talked about that these uh, medicines are also showing a decreased risk of heart disease, but I looked up the numbers on it because I, I just was trying to figure out why they won't classify obesity as an illness. Because to me, are you going to pay for it now or are you going to pay for it later when that person is diagnosed with cancer or heart disease or diabetes? So. Uh, the, M, the reluctance uh, for CMS to cover GLP and now GLP and GIP um, as a, you know, a class of medications for obesity and cover that, that is probably because of the overwhelming volume that it would represent. 2024 data is to reveal that 50% of Americans are obese. That's about 175 million people. And it was said in that article that it could put CMS into bankruptcy. But again, it's kind of like, are you going to pay for it now so that they don't present with these other diseases, which you will pay for down the line? To me, that's a conundrum. I think it's a conundrum, and I also think that, you know, the moral covenant of, of drug utilization is that volume re replaces price. And so we do need to see competition in that space, and we need to see rationalization of the prices that are being charged as these drugs become more prevalent in their use. But I, I, I do think, particularly when people have other risk factors for the complications of obesity, that we're going to need to find ways to treat them. It's always a challenge, though, because just like vaccination, things that actually prevent harm in the future are typically the last things to get reimbursed. Uh, we just don't, don't buy into the philosophy that, you know, a penny saved is a, or a penny spent is a dollar saved down the road. And our system of calculating um, the congressional budget doesn't help because it really only counts savings that occur in the same fiscal year, not savings that accrue at some later point in time. So when you're trying to balance the budget, our system makes this a really challenging calculus, even for people who are well-intentioned and trying to do the right thing. To me, another conundrum, if you will, because I like your word, in the healthcare system is the fact that healthcare today is so incredibly fragmented. Um, a person can have four, five, six doctors, and they're not necessarily talking to each other about your medical treatment. Now, I remember the day, because my dad was a doctor, he was a cancer surgeon, but he started out as a family practitioner, and he would take care of whatever ailed you, and probably your whole family, so he would know your medical history. And while we can't go back to the good old days, how do we encourage providers, in your opinion, to take that more of holistic look, that patient-centric look um, in such a fragmented healthcare system? It is really challenging. And, uh, you know, I think the concept of a medical home is a great concept. And yet even those of us who have outstanding insurance support really have trouble <laughs> finding a medical home and making sure that that medical home really is inclusive of all of the information that's relevant to your health. Ideally, better information integration would support that, but I think we're a long way from realizing the validity. And, and what happens, I think, um, and I, I believe I've had this experience myself, maybe you have too, that you don't really get to tell your story 
the narrative of your health and how it fits into your life and the things that really concern you the most, independent of what your lab tests show or what someone might find on a physical exam. So we really don't have a whole person care system at this point in time. You can get the very best specialist if you have a specific problem, but you don't always get the best care. A lot of women that I hear from like day in and day out on Facebook, a lot of them just have a gynecologist. A lot of them don't have a primary care physician. And a gynecologist isn't, you know, doing a CBC on you. They're not, they're not doing what a primary care physician. So do you think maybe we need to do a better job at educating the public as to the importance of having a primary? Because that's really the one person who's going to look at you holistically. Well, one would hope that would be the case. And I, in, in of a gynecologist, I do know some that function very well as primary care clinicians because they recognize the gap. Um, but it's really not what their, their training is, nor is it what they're necessarily expected to be doing in the constraints of the health organization that they're working in. So it's a challenge. And by the way, we are suffering from an increasing shortage of obstetricians and gynecologists across our country. So that's a whole other uh, dimension of access to health that is looming large, particularly in rural counties. Um, but I, I do feel that um, we don't have a common understanding of what are the essential primary care services that everyone should be able to access. And I, you know, personally believe that those essential primary care service should not incur significant out-of-pocket expenses. Um, but, you know, I probably have a pretty broad um, belief in what constitutes equitable access to health care in America. And I think we're so far from that right now that I have uh, little expectation that we're going to solve this anytime soon. I'd like to think that um, public education and data support systems and tools that we can put on our cell phone and all of these things, they will help some people. Um, but the reach into populations who most deem them is, is really hard to hard to um, promote. You know, this uh, conference here heard this morning a wonderful panel on AI. Uh, and since you're in the medical research uh, end of the healthcare system, give me your thoughts on how AI is going to impact medical research and maybe even impact patient care as well. Well, you know, right now AI is is a it's a thing it's like plastics you know everybody's looking to ai to solve all of our problems i think uh, the way i try to think about it is what are the problems that we need to solve and how can these information tools help do that better um, for example as, as we are able to build broad data sets of health information and make them interoperable and queryable we may be able to develop algorithms that can look at a person's profile in recent history and predict, you know what, five years from now, you're at high risk for a stroke or you're at high risk for cancer. Let's intervene now. And you can, you know, nudge um, earlier intervention, earlier diagnosis. So I think that's a kind of a low hanging fruit in, in the sense of what can be done with AI. But beyond that, I think the sky's the limit. We just have to um, be patient as we experiment and make sure that we account for the other side of the coin, which is privacy, misinformation, disinformation that can emanate from tools that are poorly understood or poorly utilized. So I'm excited about it. I think we'll, we'll, we, we will benefit, but I'm also um, cautious about how we go up that steep learning curve. Oh, okay. As we're all here talking about all the research that's going on and the, the wonderful you know, treatments and cures that can come out of this, I think we'd be lying if we didn't say kind of looming in the back of all of our heads after going through COVID is that concern that we now have, that we might not have had in the past, but that concern that we now have of a possible you know, bio crisis or bioterrorism threat. Um, I remember asking you when I interviewed you at the CDC, if we should anticipate another biocrisis or bioterrorism threat, and you said, quote, we would be naive to think that it won't happen. In your opinion, after your time at the helm of the CDC 
and at Merck and at, at, at FNIH, are we adequately prepared for that as a nation? Of course not. We know that from the experience that we've just had for the past few years. Um, we have made some progress um, since we dealt with, I think, SARS in 2003. And in some places, our science has certainly advanced. So the prospects for countermeasures are more feasible than they were then. But in terms of having robust national biosecurity plans that are evolving, exercised, and continuously improving, we are a long way from being there. And of course, everyone wants to put COVID in the rearview mirror. So our ability to really sustain the investments that we've already made and build on what we've learned, I feel kind of pessimistic about it. I have to be honest with you. I'm pushing, I'm doing everything I can in my sphere of influence to try to keep those who need to be making those decisions and implementing those policies and passing those budgets um, to, to stay on top of this. But I see that it's a very, very hard and big rock to push up the hill. And does that looming distrust that doesn't seem to be going away in healthcare and science, is that part of what gets in the way of getting people there in Washington to be making the right decisions to make sure we are better prepared? I, I don't think that distrust helps, of course, but uh, this cycle of crisis to complacency has been going on for a long time. And we, when we have a crisis, we do the right thing. We can perform miracles for a short sprint, but as soon as the crisis subsides, we kind of relax back into, whew, we made it through that. Now let's move on. And we forget that the world we're living in is primed for the emergence of new and threatening infectious diseases. I just thank um, the world that the virus that we just contended with had a mortality rate that proved to be less, of, less than 1% because I experienced SARS-1, which had a mortality rate of 10%. Just think if we had a COVID with a 10% mortality rate, what kind of world we would be living in today. So could that happen? Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I wanna to end today um, by asking you to tell us about FNIH's newest award uh, that will be given this next year that's going to be given to a journalist. Tell us about that. Well, this is make news here now, Joan. So. <laughs> Um, I will uh, preview that we will be giving a new award of the, a, a Trust in Science Journalism Award uh, to a journalist who is an exemplar of trustworthy reporting about important scientific or health issues. Um, we're working on uh, developing the nomination package now, so keep in mind that this will be an opportunity for some a credible and ethical journalist to have an opportunity to be recognized for uh, the kind of reporting that we would want all journalists to aspire to. Journalists like you, John. So, um, and thank you for your willingness to help us think through um, the who, what, when, where, and how we do this. Thank you. All right, thank you for that, Julie. And thank you, Dr. Gerberding, for taking your time out of that day that I know is you have a lot going on there in Washington. Uh, and thank you for your, your service throughout your entire life to protecting public health. Thanks, Julie. You're very welcome. It's an honor to participate. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that concludes this part of today's program. And I will turn it back over to what, Brian <laughs> or Jim? Thank you, Joan. We're going to take a, a break and we'll reconvene. Our next panel will start at 1.15, and it's the gut biome in oncology, a catalyst for research and innovation.